thanks very much for having me, Amanda and Kenny. <laughs> and, and letting me come and share some, some of my uh, recent experience outside of the workplace related largely to um, personal development in leadership and my interest in bringing that back in the workplace to help my team perform better for the organisation and for the sector. Uh, for those that don't know me, I've got, I've got some handouts. If you like one. For those that don't know me, I'm a uh, marine archaeologist at Historic England. I run a national central team uh, with underwater cultural heritage responsibility. We provide uh, policy advice, we provide advice on designation, uh, maintenance, conservation of underwater archaeology. We also run a cohort of volunteers. So um, capacity building and enabling others to get engaged in underwater archaeology is very central to what I do from our high level steer. However, I've not been asked to talk about any of that rubbish today. Uh, what I've been asked to talk about is my current sabbatical in the CLAW leadership programme. CLAW was established just over a decade ago uh, to develop a new generation of cultural leaders within the sector to affect change in how culture is led. It's a year-long programme and I'm currently three quarters of the way through. I go back to my desk in the first week of August. And it's a, an experiential course of, of learning opportunities. There's 25 individuals in my cohorts from the whole range of cultural sector and creative industries. There's dancers, there's literary agents, there's film producers, there's authors, and so on. Um, I'm the only person representing our cultural sector, as we know it. So I'm you know, very much at a kind of disadvantage, really, in understanding how the other people work, because I've only ever experienced that as a punter, you know, as a, as a participant, rather than um, uh, being involved in it. And we come together every now and again for formal parts of learning, you know, so workshops and seminars and, and presentations, those sort of things. But I'm currently in a period of where I, I find my own learning experiences with the intention of becoming a better leader for culture in the future. And I'll just shortly be starting a secondment with the British Council, interestingly, in their creative skills unit. The British Council, as you may know, reports directly to FCO. Part of their uh, creative skills is to take museum expertise out of the country you know, to, to help developing nations develop and, and acquire museum skills. But interestingly, they don't do that through DCMS. So there's a lot of dots to join up in, in the creative skills sector at the British Council. You know? So it's a very interesting uh, area. And uh, the collaborative inquiry is when the 25 of us in the cohort will come back together you know, to develop a piece of work. And I'm very grateful to Historic England's CLAW Leadership Programme, National Trust and the HLF in supporting my secondment to CLAW. So um, for those interested, there's more information in the handout. So, um, we've got a laser pointer, I'm not sure, oh, no, but okay, I don't think we do. So, uh, my personal skill development then lies within you know, a framework of capacity building supported by you know, the information base, the, the individuals, and um, talking to people, which is the awareness raising bit. So, whether capacity is enabled within the organisation, the individual, or the partnership conversation that we've been having forms part of that wider framework, but underpinned by the aspiration to deliver that through policy change. Uh, one relatively new element of policy has come from the Warwick Commission report that you might be familiar with that reported in the earlier part of this year, looking at the future of cultural value. For the first time, um, importantly for us, heritage is being seen as part of the broader cultural spectrum. So for, outs for those outside of heritage, culture has been defined as being arts and culture broadly, and you can see that in the current manifestos as well. You know, there's very little mention of, of heritage. But for the Warwick Commission, the cultural spectrum now includes heritage. So, you know, for the first time, government is beginning to see um, culture inclusive of heritage, which is a real sort of significant achievement for us. But in relation to today's talk, then, the Warwick Commission um, required, in, in, in one of their um, reporting elements, that the boards of publicly funded bodies should have individuals with expertise in um, education training and therefore capacity building. You know, so putting, putting this interest, the interest of this group today, you know, right at the very top levels of publicly funded organisations. And it will be interesting to see how that pans out over the next few years. So Mike has um, already eloquently spoken about um, 2020. And you'll recall these five points from earlier this afternoon. 
I see the, the top three being largely institutional and workplace based. You know, so, so Amanda's area of expertise here is in that workforce development. My interest in, and the focus of this presentation is largely taking that outside to enable others to engage in what we do, you know, to broaden the interest, to broaden the involvement. Oh, and, wrong way. and that then clearly follows through into the new corporate plan of Historic England. Now these key words stimulate participation and get others to become involved in that at all sorts of various <coughs> levels. And, and we can see the, the sort of the determination and the aspiration to enable that through the grant programme fixed at seventeen and a half million pounds per year as set out in the corporate plan. Now it's interesting that um, you'll, you'll know from recent headlines that inflation is currently zero percent. That's largely because clothing as food and food has gone down, fuel has gone up, which has balanced out um, inflation. But you know, just take my pocket calculator. Inflation at half half a percent causes a drop in the spending power of, of the Commission's program <coughs> of eighty-eight and a half thousand pounds. You know, so the aspiration is there to deliver from historic England um, seventeen and a half million pounds worth of, of grant aid to capacity outside the sector, outside into the sector. So let's just have a, a quick wee look at um, some of the leadership experiences that I've been um, exposed to as part of the, the CLAW programme and then we'll look at how that relates to capacity a little bit later on. For the CLAW programme themselves and that interview, they have a list of, of what they expect leaders to look like. You know, they expect leaders to be themselves, they expect leaders to be creative. And as I said, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage with the dancers on the course programme. I, I, won't, I won't subject to you something to that, but I'm sure I'm creative in other ways, as my mother keeps telling me. <laughs> they, they require uh, their leaders to be you know, ambitious and um, strategic. I'll look at uh, courage uh, in the next slide. You know, having that radar, looking ahead, future gazing, future proofing. Now, what will my team at work be doing in the next five years? What will we be having to deliver for the historic environment in the next five years? You know, they want us to kind of, you know, um, have interest in wider areas, you know, in other things outside of our day-to-day -day professionalism. They want us um, to be able to translate that strategy, that strategic vision, into practical delivery through projects. And, and we'll look at that a little bit later on. So what I've um, kind of come around to thinking, and uh, Bill will be familiar with this, with um, Major Dick Winters of Band of Brothers, um, uh, from his biography, uh, this really sort of resonates with me. Um, Competence then kind of comes from within. You know, you know, it, it's the it's the thing that we've been appointed to. It's our professionalism. It's our expertise. You know, the competence in that area allows us to be a leader and stand up and and talk about it. Courage then doesn't come from kind of sheer bravery and jumping off a cliff or any of that tough mudder stuff. It's the ability really to be um, resilient to change, to understand and identify those opportunities open to us. And, and to really to take those risks, to engage with those opportunities. You know, be, be courageous to take those risks at work. Now, I'm very keen that um, I don't expect anybody to do anything that I wouldn't want to do. You know, so stand out in front, you know, be that person you, you need to be. Now, for those who know me, I do all that kind of tough mother stuff, really, just to um, stay in shape. But I, I translate that staying into shape in being um, a, a means to maintain mental agility and mental ability. You know, by being physically fit, that time flies when you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, you know, the point of this then is kind of the humility element. That's interesting for me because it doesn't really matter to me who gets the credit for a job well done. You know, it's a, t it's a team effort. Anyway, you can't come to an archaeological <coughs> conference and not talk about alcohol. So, um, disti <laughs> distilling. My leadership then, you know, I think the key element is I enjoy what I do because I can allow others to excel, you know, to help within the sector. So speeding up then, um, the skills that we all have in, the, in this room, you know, that, that Ed eloquently spoke about, you know, from finding things to archiving things and presenting, that gives us as archaeologists, historians, that <laughs> talent for clear expression. So bolting those two together then, Helping others to be their best, that talent for clear expression is the conversations that we need to have within that broader sector. Um, I take my authority from the centre for what I do. It's slightly different to the circle of trust, mind. The circle of authority is where I'm employed to deliver, 
um, I can then influence very strongly the center of my team, you know, how they deliver what they do. I have a marginal authority within the wider organization of Historic England. I can help influence how maritime archaeological policy is delivered in there, but I have slightly less influence in that, of course, and I have even less influence in how the public engages with underwater archaeology in the wider society, but I still have the, the ability to influence. So, somewhere in that then, um, in the core, in the centre, I have a very strong influence in what I do, but taking that out into society, I have a weaker influence because, of course, I cannot tell one of our volunteers what to do. I have to persuade them to do so. And in fact, it was Eisenhower that, that said, the art of leadership is getting somebody else to do something you want to do because they want to do it. It's persuasion, it's the conversations. It's the balancing then between all of this, you all recall the heritage cycle, which is still highly current, you know, getting people to engage by enabling to create those opportunities for others to get involved, to tell those stories that we were, to, that we were spoke, speaking about, that talent for clear expression. We can do that then through this managing how we deal with people, you know, network, all the Twitter that's been going on, you know, there's so many different platforms to engage, but nothing beats face-to-face -face communication. We need to identify where those key influences are. We need to identify where we need to go and work back how we're going to get there and how to overcome those obstacles along the way. Who we need to talk to to get there. I might be only saying much about um, skillful communication apart from it has to be outside the sector. That two-way conversation is the, the ability to persuade. So boiling that down again then, you know, we need to be patient with within, within individuals. You know, those people that, that we don't have that don't have paid influence at work, that aren't employees. You know, we need to be patient, we need to coach them along, we need to coach them and encourage them. We need to be realistic, although that's an R not a P. And of course, you know, we need to persist in doing what we, what we think is the right thing to do, to help people get engaged. So just um, one quick case study then. Um, for those that aren't archaeologists, there's a seal in there, just come up to the gun rocks, that, that the wrecks that the ship itself bumped into on the Farne Islands, uh, Tyneside, British Sub Aqua Club worked with us uh, a couple of summers ago in investigating a post medieval cannon assemblage that we were looking at for designation. But the actual divers themselves have taken it on from what was a very interesting sheltered dive site. You know, the story now is them of investigating a post medieval shipwreck site, an assemblage of iron ordnance underwater. And it's become such a thing for them that they were on telly with Robson Green a few weeks ago. You know, no, there was no um, historic England, his, her, her, English heritage involvement in that TV show, that was led by the team that enabled through our work, you know, building coalitions. So the two most important points then of this talk really is that we need to talk to people much, much better. We need to be able to tell those stories and share those stories to ignite those passions in people, you know, to, to help encourage them to preserve the interest that, that we have at work. And ultimately, you know, if you're going to make a promise, stick to it. Never give anyone any reason to doubt your integrity. And for me then, being an interest in military history, the last word on leadership was got to go to Churchill. You know, a bad leader stands up here and tells you how good they are. A good leader tells you how good you are. Okay. Thank you. On time? I'm the speaking. All right.